welcome to a brand new episode of A Dane Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfamenta. If this is your first time tuning into the podcast, I welcome you and we hope that you come back for future episodes and more content. If you're a returning listener or viewer of the podcast, we welcome you back for a very special episode of the podcast. But before we get to the main event, I want to just share a few quick announcements. Uh, first and foremost, we have our inaugural Stay True to Teacher and You virtual summit that's happening April 16th through 19th. And like I said, it's all virtual. We have 20 plus phenomenal educators who are going to be pouring into us for the next four days. And it's going to be all focused on teacher wellness self-care, social-emotional learning, and finally, culturally responsive anti-racist practices. So if you are a K-12 educator who's looking to get some professional development credits towards your license and you want to build your capacity in those areas, this is the conference for you. Uh, make sure you go to www.adaintalkforeducators.com backslash conference to learn more about the summit and the different things that will be taking place there. And then secondly, if you're looking for some apparel for this upcoming spring season, we have some new designs at our Day Talk Apparel Shop, and we're hitting librarians, we're hitting STEAM educators, and just all educators within the spectrum. So if you're interested in getting some swag, some new gear for the upcoming season, Make sure you tap into our Teespring store at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the Idain Talk Apparel Shop and check us out. All right. Now that we took care of that, let's get to the main event. As I mentioned, we have our Stay True to Teaching You Summit coming up. And one of our participants is actually going to be the guest today. Uh, she is a longtime social justice educator and the author of the brand new book, Reading, Writing, and Racism, Disrupting Whiteness in Teacher Education and in the Classroom. So, y'all, we're going to get very real in this conversation tonight. Uh, she's currently a professor of education at Montclair State University in New Jersey. And she's just doing phenomenal work in this arena. Uh, so without further ado, I want to bring on Dr. Bree Pickauer to the podcast so we can have this conversation. Welcome. Hello, sorry. Like, no problem. No <laughs> thank problem. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Um, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. And as I've mentioned to you off air, I've been enjoying your book and I just can't wait to dive in uh, to have this conversation. Thank you. It means so much to hear that. You know, you work on something in isolation for so long. And so it's um, it it means a lot. It's very validating to hear that people are feel like they're getting something out of it. I just think it's right on time. And I know you've been doing this work for a long time, uh, well before the publishing of this book. So to finally have it come for full circle and people are finally seeing the, the breadth and the depth of it. Um, I, I can, I can assure you, um, it's rewarding and it's something that people are really paying attention to for sure. All right. So, Let's get started with this question. I ask all my guests this. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, and what brought you into the education field? Sure. Um, so growing up, I always uh, found myself working with children, um, either through tutoring or working in summer camps, um, after school programs. And so I always knew that I was going to have a career with children in some way. Um, but it took me a little while to actually get into teaching because my experiences, um, well, I had, I had some experiences in college where I was co-directing an after-school program 
in Ann Arbor, Michigan at a place called the Peace Neighborhood Center, which still has my heart. Um, and I was seeing the way in which the, the community center served predominantly black children. And I was seeing the ways in which they were um, really being marginalized in their predominantly white schools and classrooms. And I felt like I did not wanna be a part of that. Um, and so I ended up doing different work in education, work around the educational equity with an organization that's now called the National Equity Project. At the time it was called the Bay Area Coalition of Essential Schools. And, um, and through that work, I met some phenomenal teachers who were really using their place in the classroom to um, resist, resist racism and resist educational inequality. And it inspired me to become a classroom teacher. So that was sort of my roundabout path into the classroom. And I know with a lot of your work, you're focusing a lot on whiteness and how it manifests itself within the curriculum and other aspects of the educational experience. But one thing I've noticed in the work that a lot of anti-racist educators do, and even in my own experience, you know, working with white colleagues and coworkers, is that a lot of them are very oblivious to the fact that they have privilege. And when you try to communicate that to them, it comes as a surprise. So I want to know from you, when did you have your own awakening? So when was that first time where you're consciously aware of your own white privilege and how were you able to acknowledge it or come to that conclusion? Um, I, well, I definitely know the phenomenon you're talking about. And I think I actually realized it very early on but I didn't have the language or vocabulary to understand what was happening. Um, I think some of the first experiences were at my high school um, and, or actually it was, it was actually middle school. And my best friend at the time um, was Puerto Rican. She is Puerto Rican. And she was like my pillar when it came to math. <laughs> she was so much better at math than I was. And when they started to put us into tracked classes, she was put into a lower track math class than I was. And that made no sense. Like there was nothing that could possibly explain that outside of racism. And so the adv advocacy work that her mom had to do to get her moved up, not, not even into my math, but to the top math track, um, it, she was really had to work uphill. And so I, I learned a lot from that experience and seeing what happened to her. And I also remember other experiences in my high school in which the students of color had to advocate for themselves around policies that were um, really problematic. And so, you know, thanks to their awareness, it, it helped to shape my awareness. Um, but I didn't really you know, fully comprehend it because I think growing up, it was also a lot of class privilege and kind of trying to pull apart race and class privilege was something that until I then was exposed to it in my college classes, um, mm -hmm. I was start I was able to start to figure it out. Doesn't mean I, ha you know, still even have it together. You know, you can be as aware as as anyone around issues of white privilege and issues of whiteness. It doesn't mean that I don't still manifest them. I'm just a little more aware of it when I do. And you talk a lot about that um, within your book, how you still struggle with those internal battles and conflicts and, and how sometimes you have to check yourself. But I think the great thing about you is you have the awareness. And as long as you have the awareness, you always have the ability to redirect your behavior and to stay the course, which is something that I know you talk about a lot. But I want to talk about this phenomenal book, which everybody should read. Everybody needs to read this book, Reading, Writing, and Racism, Disrupting Whiteness in Teacher Education and in the Classroom. And I know you and I, we've had conversations around the different aspects of it, but the way you articulate it in the book is so methodical and so well thought out. And it's easy to digest too, because I know sometimes we can get real heavy with 
with the jargon and and with the uh, different you know terms which can throw people off, but you keep it very simple, which is you know what I love about it, uh, especially if it's a non-educator reading it. But I want to know what ultimately inspired you to write the book, and what's the overarching mission you'd like to achieve uh, with the book? Sure. Well, I I originally wrote the book because I was sitting on this collection of a viral racist curriculum, and I knew I wanted to do something with it, um, and I wanted to go. Um, because I, ha I had started collecting this curriculum to use with my students to, because I always have students, my students are people who are studying to become teachers. And I always have a subset of students who just don't, don't recognize the impact that racism still has today. You know, they think that racism was solved in 1968 and we may still have some white supremacist, you know, Ku, Ku Klux Klan types, but they don't realize how embedded it is in every every aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I started collecting these examples of current viral racist curriculum to show them, no, this, this is still happening today. Um, and, and then the collection just ballooned and I, I was sitting on so many of these and I was like, there's, I wanna do something with it and I wanna do something that isn't just the shock and awe of them. I wanted to really understand how they function to maintain white supremacy. And I really wanted to be able to show that these aren't just singular examples that come from a like a isolated racist teacher. Right. I wanted to show that it was really part of the way whiteness has, we've all internalized whiteness, white people and people of color, that we've all internalized whiteness. And that until we shake that up and we really examine it, we are going to, it's going to show up in the curriculum. And so to me, the main, the main purpose of the book is to show the connection between what we all, what we've internalized and then how that manifests itself in schools. And I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that whiteness is something that even people of color experience. And I know for myself going through a K-12 school system where at one point I was at a predominantly white school. I mean, I I experienced whiteness just through the curriculum, not being able to learn about my history, but also some of the notions that we end up receiving as developing teachers, like the idea of, of perfectionism, the idea of, of following a specific structure and only that structure and not having allowance for other inclusive strategies, uh, which you talk about in the book. But going back to the examples you mentioned uh, with regard to the viral uh, racist curriculum, a lot of those examples that I read about were very overt examples where people could easily say, well, is this individual? It's not the system, it's the individual. So in what ways do you try to help your students understand that Whiteness is embedded in the very systems that we operate under in our society. Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's actually something I'm really realizing and that if I ever get a chance to do a second volume of this, I want to include more subtle examples because right after, actually right after the book launched and my students came to one of the book launch events, um, they then had to turn in a project, which was a social justice lesson plan. And I was, as I was going through to give them feedback, I saw so much curriculum so white in their lesson plans. And so we were able to have a conversation using that shared vocabulary of like, where are you seeing some curriculum so white in here? And these students are not at all <laughs> like, <laughs> overt racist teachers like they want they signed up to be in the social justice program they are dedicated to anti-racism they're about it and yet whiteness still found its way into their curriculum and so like for one of them who's a young man of color um it was around you know he was replicating the kind of curriculum that he had received and so it was a lesson plan about indigenous people 
and the the overall framework of like the overall objective of the lesson was to think about the ways that the US government helped Native Americans. And so when you look at the history of indigenous people in the US government, it is not a story of helping, right? But yet he was using the district curriculum. That's what was in the curriculum. He had never received the historical content knowledge to be able to recognize, wait, there's something wrong happening here. And so he was replicating that same story, that same curriculum. And when he realized it, he was heartbroken. You know, so I think that that's, um, that's a really subtle and insidious way that it's not just teachers who want to maintain white supremacy. There are teachers who don't want to, and that they still fall into it. And with regard to just the structure of uh, the program at Montclair State, because I know you have a teacher um, residency within university, which is very different from traditional teacher ed programs. And what I read about in with your program is you pretty much front load the fact that, hey, people, we're going to be talking about a lot of race. We're going to be having some hard, transparent conversations. So just to give you the disclaimer, if you can't handle it, this may not be the program for you. And not every program does that because I think we focus so much on getting teachers prepare for the praxis test, whatever licensure test that you have to take. So I guess my question is, how do you stay true to the mission of developing socially conscious anti-racist teachers, but knowing at the same time that we operate within a system where the very licensure test that we are given perpetuate whiteness you know, to a degree. So how how do we navigate within those waters? It, it is a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge we've really been talking about in light of the growing um, conversations around abolitionism in education. And my colleague and I have really been talking about like, how can we, how can we, be inspired by and bring in abolitionist practices, knowing that we're within an institution that is complicit with the kind of things that you're talking about, right? Our students still have to pass the practice. They still are doing the EdTPA. And these are white supremacist gatekeeping policies that, you know, we're not necessarily challenging. I mean, we're challenging, but you know, that's not, I'm not on the front lines of those battles. And so, it's really um, a conversation that we are having pretty deeply to be thinking about how are we able to support our students to be subversive in their teaching um, and to go against the grain and all the other you know phrases that are about that while knowing that we're still within these institutions um, that are upholding whiteness. It's definitely a challenge. And in the book, I look at five different programs and how they're trying to, to do those things. And, and some of it is that explicitness um, and also not pretending that these, these things aren't a problem. Like we'll talk about the way that the EdTPA and the Praxis is gatekeeping, and yet we still need you to pass this, just like they're gonna have to do with their students. So is it safe to say that part of the education is helping your student teachers you know to navigate these very systems they're going to be going into so you so just let them know that hey you may get an evaluation that pretty much reinforces the very things that we've been talking about in this program as far as whiteness is concerned you may come across an assessment a standardized test that has some racist questions in there. How will you respond to that when you see it? So is it a case where it's scenario driven or it's like, be aware that this is what's gonna happen when you leave us? I think a lot of it is just helping them to be explicit. So like, for example, we do an activity um, that we call windows into the classroom. And so it's our students bring in videotapes of them teaching. 
and then they give each other feedback um, using, a, you know, looking at a variety of different criteria. And we, we just modeled this protocol for our students and for their mentor teachers this week. And when we do it, we use a video clip of a different teacher. And in the first clip, her students, she's trying to get the students to line up at the end of the day. And it's very mm -hmm. chaotic. Um, and then in the second clip, it's the same teacher. And this is a real teacher. We got the clips online. Um, in the second clip, it's a real teacher. And she's, it's the same teacher. And she's kind of gotten it together in the sense that the students line up. She can get them over to the rug. They can sit down. They have their materials. And it's very organized and structured. And so at first, when they the mentors and the residents saw that, they were commenting on, oh, how controlled it is and how the teacher is organized and how the students are responding. And it's all very positive. And it takes a while of prompting for them to start to realize, well, they're, she's singling out this one child. Mm -hmm. She's not being kind to this one child. And once someone starts to recognize that, then finally someone was like, this looks very militarized. This looks very regimented. There's no joy. Um, the children are not able to express themselves. And finally they're starting to realize like just because it's quote unquote better than the first example, doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean that it's what we want to see in our classrooms. And so from there, we're able to have a very explicit conversation and we put up images from the school to prison pipeline and we show them this is what when we're talking about the school to prison pipeline or what scholars are now calling the school to prison nexus this is what we're talking about like this is where we're training these young students of color to line up hands at the side no talking silence no touching all of these rules are happening in this little classroom and you know, I think when we we're able to have those kinds of explicit conversations, and then we even debrief to talk about why did it take us so long? Like a bunch of you felt it in your bodies that this wasn't right. You knew it, but you didn't say anything for a long time. So how can we start to break through even that when you start to get that feeling of tightness in your chest, your face is getting a little bit red, you know something's wrong, but you don't know how to break through that veneer of politeness, that's a risk we need you to start taking, right? Because once someone said it, then the chat was blowing up. Yes, I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. But it took that one person to say, this looks militarized. And so we're, we're teaching them to have those conversations. We're teaching them to lean into those feelings when they start to recognize that something isn't right, but they're not sure what to do. Um, those are skills. You know, those are skills that I'm still developing. I still don't want to hurt someone's feelings and say, um, I mean, like one of my alumni just posted a Dr. Seuss quote this week. Oh, and this, no. And, uh, you know, Dr. Seuss, like you've been knowing that Dr. Seuss is a problem. It's been mm -hmm. on social media for years. And this year, even Dr. Seuss's family foundation knows that it's a problem. They right. take it off. The headlines are everywhere now. It's not just that you have to be on some lefty Facebook page, right? It's in the news. And so to put up a quote this week, and I didn't write anything in there, and I'm still in my head thinking about how am I, I don't want to publicly shame her, but I know I need to say something to her. And you gotta so call her in. Me, exactly, exactly. You gotta call so her I, in. I got to send a private message. I don't want to do it on her page, but like, I, you know, I know that I need to, but this is still that skill. Like we're still all working on, still working on developing those moments when we exactly call people in. And it's interesting just going back to the line up example, because I grew up having to line up and walk on one side of the hallway the whole time I was in K-12 education. So I'm looking at it as something normal as I'm going through my own teach education program. I'm not thinking about it as a way that whiteness is being manifested and perpetuated. I'm thinking of it as, oh, that's just the norm because I had to do it when I was a kid. And it wasn't until later on in my career where I realized, hmm, these uniform policies, the, the way we have to line up, the fact that 
quietness equates to compliance and students listening to the teacher. Like you, like if you're too loud, that all that automatically means that you're out of control. So just this idea of context, it just seems to get lost um, in the conversation. But with regard to just rules of engagement, could you talk about how we have to conduct ourselves professionally and how we have to advocate professionally within our settings? That's something that you don't really hear about in a lot of teacher education programs because it's so focused on passing the praxis and mm-hmm. getting you know our license. So how do we continue to push our student teachers to build their power so that they can have the courage to, to speak up without fear of consequence? How, how do we continue to do that? Well, at one point I wrote an article called Teacher Education Does Not End at Graduation. And so I think part of it is having these ongoing long-term relationships with our students. Um, We're lucky it's part of our residency. Part of the funding that we've received goes to what we call induction, where our students, when they officially graduate, are still with us for three years and come back for professional development. And a lot of that professional development is actually led by our alumni because they've been sitting there um, where, where our recent alum have been. And so some of it is knowing that it's not gonna happen in the year and a half, right? That we're starting some of these conversations there and that we're continuing those conversations and just being available to our students as people once they graduate, if they run into a dilemma, that they have a sounding board that they can talk to of trying to figure out how to navigate and how to advocate um, for their students. Because, you know, a lot of times, not so much in the programs that I run because they happen while simultaneously to the students being in the classrooms. But a lot of times, you know, so much teacher education that happens for the land of make-believe they're not really in classrooms and they're developing these lesson plans. Um, And so I think as much as we can extend the work that we're doing with people so that it's happening real time in their classrooms, um, we we can be better at doing some of those things. Oh, absolutely. Um, That is so true. And with regard to the teacher education program, um, and I know you talked about vetting students when they do apply for it to make sure that they're a great fit. But what if you have that student who goes through the program, but for whatever reason, they're not aligning with the principles of the program to the point where you have to consider having them removed or exited out of the program? Is there is is there a structure within you, your university where okay if they're out this program do they then go to is there a traditional montclair state teacher ed program that doesn't have that social justice focus that they could just go to or yeah. like how does it's that a, work it's a, it's a real it's a real dilemma yeah it's a real dilemma because technically all of our students you know, all teachers should be getting this kind of education. I Um, agree. And so the ones that are most interested, most dedicated, most passionate, self-select themselves into these kind of programs, these social justice oriented program and racial justice programs. And so then that leaves, you know, it's so much better for them. Oftentimes what brought them to the, our programs is the racism itself in the traditional programs. They're sitting in predominantly white classrooms. They're listening to these future teachers talk about oftentimes the neighborhoods that they came from, calling them bad neighborhoods, sketchy neighborhoods, places I don't wanna teach, I don't wanna go there. I'm gonna do everything I can to get out of my placement there. I'm gonna have my mom call to get me out of my place with her. So the students who've come into the racial justice programs are often from those communities. They've been sitting next to these future teachers and, you know, it's been very traumatizing. And so that's part of what brings them into our programs. But then you have these, pro the, the traditional program is left without the potential of, of these students to interrupt. 
And so it creates this real dilemma of, um, of what about all the other teachers who are also going to graduate and potentially harm children in schools, right? And so um, I wish that I had a solution for that. I think part of what I can say is happening is that because of the success of some of these racial justice programs, other programs want to learn from them and want to bring some of those practices in. Um, there's, you know, obviously a demand right now around racial justice. And so I think people are ready to, some people are ready to learn. Um, the challenge is, is that it requires deep racial reflection, not just for the student teachers, but for the professors. And professors are in very different places um, when it comes to their desire to do that because a lot of teacher educators come into the field because they're passionate about their subject area. So they were right. experts in their subject area. Um, you know, they're not necessarily there um, with a social or racial justice aim. And so it's seen as kind of extra work that they have to do or work that they feel like they've done that, they've gone to a, they've, they've read some books, ch they can check it off. Right. I just find it interesting that you could have your program within a university and then the traditional program housed under the same institution. So it just makes me wonder what those conversations are like between, you know, the deans and the other professors. And then you almost wonder, will there ever be a time where those two programs will merge given the the urge for more anti-racist teaching and in that focus. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be ideal, you know, and and ideally more and more of the principles of what we do would find their way into the traditional program. Again, it goes to, you know, who's teaching those classes and, and their ability, teacher educators' ability to do this kind of interruptive work of recognizing whiteness and and trying to disrupt it. Um, and it's also, you know, to be honest, it's it's expensive. You know, yes. we're we're paying for um, a lot of professional development. Like we send our students to undoing racism. We bring in um, people from the flourish agenda that does radical healing work. Um, we are we spend more time in the field. We expect more from our field supervisors because our field supervisors have to not only be reviewing lesson plans for just teaching and pedagogy, but also for social justice. So we do professional development for the field supervisors. There's additional professional development that we do for our mentor teachers. So we know we need to pay our mentor teachers more because we expect more from them than from the mentor teachers in the traditional program. So that is a big part of the dilemma as well, is that, um, you know, we, we, are, we do not wanna be in the business of asking people of color to do unpaid labor. And so mm -hmm. there is, um, you know, expenses in asking people with expertise around race and racial justice. And we're, you know, always privileging the voices of BIPOC folks. So there's, um, there's money that we need to raise to be able to do that. And that's something that is consistent with other universities and institutions of higher learning as well. You know, none of this is cheap. You have to make the investment for sure. So I want to switch gears and talk about the tools of whiteness because you mentioned this a lot throughout the book and when I read through the framework, it reminded me of Sadker's seven forms of instructional bias because they talk about those different things that you mentioned, but you take it a step further with some more vivid examples. Uh, so I want to know how can school districts and even teacher education programs that are not focus on social justice, use this framework to properly audit curriculum materials and resources because that's not something that you learn in a teacher education program typically. 
And usually it requires intrinsic motivation on the teacher's part to want to engage in this work. So how can we make that more of a normalized part of, of those programs? That is such a hard question because I agree that unless there is some, unless people are, you know, people do what they're evaluated on oftentimes. And so we can't have racial justice only be this extra thing that some people who want to focus on it can focus on it and everyone else doesn't have to. Um, but at the same time, when whiteness shows up in the curriculum or when curricular tools of whiteness show up in the curriculum, it is a symptom of the deeply rooted internalized whiteness within the individual teacher. And so my concern is that we would just kind of tinker with the curriculum itself. But then when the teacher is given something else to teach, they're still going to rely on their internalized beliefs around race. And unless that's what we're adjusting, then the adjusting the curriculum itself isn't going to do it. So I think the curriculum could give some windows um, into what's happening. But I would worry about just really... Um, evaluating curriculum on its own. So recently I've been using the example because it's been in the news of the 1619 project and the 1776 project. Yeah. If a teacher is presented with both of these, one being a racial justice curriculum and the other being a racist curriculum, they're going to dig in and teach the one that they believe in. You know, the one that aligns to their belief system is the one that they're going to choose. And so it's not about tinkering with 1619 or 1776. There's always going to be options on both the right and the left for teachers to choose from. It's about helping them to examine why is it that I want to teach this American progress, you know, American progress story and whites as innocent story. What are my beliefs that are aligning to that? Once I can change my beliefs, then I will never have to worry about evaluating that teacher's curriculum because they're gonna, they're, it will be aligned with this newly thought through belief system. Now, do you also believe that because most of our country follows some iteration of the Common Core frameworks, that the way the language uh, within the framework is, is expressed, it allows for the autonomy for teachers to make those executive decisions as far as which curriculum they want to use. Oh, I don't want to use 1716. I mean, 1776. I want to go ahead and use a 1619 project or vice versa. Do you think that also plays a role in teachers being able to make those decisions that can sometimes be uh, racist and, and detrimental to students of color? I don't think necessarily because teachers are always going to find wiggle room. And I wouldn't want a prescriptive national curriculum anyway, because, you know, we look at the impact that states like Texas have on the textbook industry, and we see that, you know, it, it ends up aligning with kind of evangelical beliefs in the textbook. Um, and so I would worry about having too prescriptive of a curriculum. But I think that there are ways that you know, um, the example that I was talking about before of the lesson plan that was about the the U.S. Um, government and its role in helping indigenous people, quote unquote, helping indigenous people. <laughs> um, you know, even if a teacher is presented with that and that's the mandated curriculum and that's what they have to teach, you could still use that same curriculum to ask students about that, to say, hmm, let's think about how the US government is being talked about. Now, when we look at this map of how the US government took over indigenous land and colonized indigenous land, does that look like helping, right? We could still use that same curriculum and start to develop the students' critical thinking skills. Um, and, and let's see, when they talked about indigenous people on this lesson plan, did they name the, the different nations? 
did they were were the indigenous people framed as being active or were they passive? Let's think about how they were talked about in this in this lesson plan. Do we think that that's does that compare to this other book that we read? Right. So you could still use a problematic curriculum and help the students develop the same critical skills that you have in recognizing that it's a problem because they're going to continue to be confronted with racist books and racist curriculum. And so even better if they can see it themselves. And all that you mentioned requires what you call a reframing. You have to reframe your mind and you have to almost do a, a personal audit of your own behaviors and, the, and your own preconceived notion that you have with regard to race, with regard to gender and, and all other aspects. So how do we get educators to continue to be in that spirit of reframing these concepts that they've been conditioned to think about from the time they've been brought to this earth? How do we, how do we get educators to do that? Because that's not easy to do, especially as they get deeper into their teaching careers. And, and I've seen it firsthand with some of my um, former colleagues and coworkers. So it's easier said than done for sure. I think having, um, continual opportunities to be engaged in these kind of conversations is important. Um, like I said, there's induction that we do. So those conversations are continuing. And um, my colleague, Tanya Maloney and I, um, we, we host a speaker series so we can have our alum have a place to come back to continually engage in these conversations. In my experience, when teachers are first asked to do this reframing, oftentimes there's a level of defensiveness that happens and a level of discomfort, but then it becomes something that they seek out. You know, once they realize it's not that I'm, you're not telling me I'm racist. You're not telling me I'm ignorant. That's what they hear at first. But once they get past that and they realize I was never taught this, I have so much to learn that for some teachers, there is a real motivation and a drive there to do that reading, to do that education, to go hear the speaker, to sign up for this webinar, to listen to this podcast, um, that once it starts, oftentimes it's hard to get it to, to turn off. Yeah, and, and, and it's one thing to listen to this podcast and to read the books, but the action has to follow. Like what you write in your book is actionable knowledge, meaning that you need to take what's in here and put into action within your own school district, your own classroom, wherever you teach students. So I want to know from you, because recently there's been a lot of talk around white anti-racist educators um, capitalizing off of, you know, pain and suffering of people of color, particularly black and indigenous folks. And I know for you, you're, you're someone who has always been open and transparent about how you use your positionality as a white woman to engage in this work and to reinvest into those communities in which, you know, you're being a co-conspirator for. So I'm interested in knowing how the evolution has been for you as a social justice educator and the ways in which you've been able to use your positionality to, to help uh, black and indigenous uh, people of color in this work? I mean, it's, it's hard. It's definitely like um, something that I think about all the time, not hard, like, you know, being exposed to racism hard, but hard in that it's, it's something that is an ongoing process and something that I have to think about um, at all times. Um, so, you know, the book, um, all of, all of my royalties from the book are going to, to, um, organizations that are led by black indigenous people of color, um, the education for liberation network and the abolitionist teaching network. Um, and I think part of it is also, I remember a very long time ago, I mean, a long time ago, I think I, I wasn't even a teacher yet, but I was at a conference 
and I was in a workshop that was about um, racism. And it, I was sitting at a table and everybody at the table was white. And someone was saying, you know, someone had pointed it out and someone said, well, we need to bring more people to the table. And I just will never forget how that rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, you know what? I think I'm just gonna get up and go to a different table. Like, it's not always about inclusiveness into a racist structure, right? It's changing the structure altogether. So what is it about this table that was not inviting to folks of color? It's not about pulling up a chair. It's about changing what's happening within this. And so I think I'm kind of thinking this throughout out loud right now for the first time, but you know, I, I always aim to be sure that I'm working in community with people of color um, and not being, you know, I think there's, there's space for affinity groups. So there's space for white people to be having these conversations about race together, but it's a problem. It's problematic when outside of those purposeful white affinity spaces, it's an all white group of people trying to talk about what to do for or on behalf of people of color. Um, and there's a lot of work that I just intentionally am not going to do. Like I'm not going to do um, work around internalized, how people of color internalize racism. Like that's not my place as a white person. I'll, I'll talk about how teachers and curriculum are creating, you know, problematic opportunities for, for people of color to internalized racism, but I'm not going to get into anything that's going to be framing um, people of color's experiences from a deficit perspective um, or, you know, certain questions that I'll be asked and say, that's not a, that's not a question for me to answer. Like what should parents of color do when they come across racist curriculum? That's, that's not my place to tell parents of color how they should, what they should do with their experiences of racism. Right. And and just to add on to what, what you're saying, you also mentioned the fact that when you're given opportunities, whether they're monetary opportunities to talk to a school or an organization about this work, you're very clear in saying, I need to be co-facilitating with a person of color. Like that is a mandated requirement for me in order for me to take on this opportunity. And, and that's not something that's common, you know, in this space. So I just want to know from you, like how, how that's worked out and, and how have people responded to that? Because that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It, it happens in a variety of ways. I would say there are some times that I facilitate by myself. And it's usually, it's like, I would say, not usually, but 100% this year, it's at the request of people of color who are just kind of fed up with the whiteness that they're experiencing and are like, we just need a white person to come in here and say this stuff, please. So in those situations, I'm more comfortable to, to do it individually where I feel like I'm just sort of like, this is what is being asked of me as a white person by people of color. So yes, that then it's my place to do that. Um, it was interesting. I just had been asked to lead um, kind of a book club for a faculty. And I had initially thought, well, it's a book club around my book. So I think I can do that on my own. Um, and I was using the discussion guide that was co-written by myself and, and my colleague, Tanya Maloney, who's a black woman. And so I kind of felt like that should be fine, but I quickly realized it actually wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't um, the, the folks of color, like someone had raised in the comments, like, that they weren't sure how to locate themselves in some of the prompts that I had been given. And so, um, you know, it, it, it was clear like, oh, for these future sessions, I need to bring a, a co-facilitator in. Um, and so that was a lesson again that, okay, like 
yeah, I'm, there's something to this um, co-facilitation. It's really, it really is that important. And it was interesting because I shared that reflection back to the faculty um, when I came back with my co-facilitator and um, someone wrote in the comments that, you know, they sort of challenged that I, the way I had said it was that I was bringing in a co-facilitator of color for the participants of color, but that really everybody needs this mixed race facilitation team, not just the people of color. And so again, like I said, it's an ongoing, I was like, yeah, there's something to that. Um, and so there is just this sort of ongoing level of reflection that's required in this work. And I think that's one way that I can see that I've grown that in the past, I, you know, I, when I first saw that comment, I did experience a moment of white fragility where I was like, well, blah, blah. But then I recognized, oh, I'm doing that white fragility thing. Let me stop and reflect. And I'm quicker on that than I used to be. You know, even just the, the quickness in which I went from like, oh, it was a mistake for me to facilitate this by myself. Let me fix this. I think in the past it would have been that was a mistake. I'm a horrible person. What right do I have to be doing this racial justice? I would have spiraled and, and I don't spiral as much anymore. I can recognize like, I messed up. We all do harm. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to be accountable? So the last question I have for you is what are some things that educators can do to at least begin the process of disrupting whiteness within their school settings. And it could be at the macro level in the classroom or even in a more grander scale, like the district. So where are a few things that they can do right now for those who are interested? I think it's definitely starting with yourself and learning the frameworks of how racism operates, learning the history of how racism operates so that you can learn to recognize it. And when I say how racism operates, oftentimes we just learn about how racism has negatively impacted people of color. And that's important, but equally important is to study how racism has advantaged white people. And so learning both of those is critical to be able to create change within yourself and to create change within your classroom. Um, and I think the the better you become at that, the better your relationships with your students are going to be, the better your relationships with your students and your curriculum. You know, that's also part of it. The, the, the more um, justice centered your curriculum is, the more engaged your students are going to be. So once you develop those curri that curriculum that is engaging your students and you have powerful, authentic relationships with your students, everyone in your school is gonna know it because you're gonna have different relationships with your students than other teachers have had with the, those same children. And that's going to give you um, a platform that you wouldn't have if, you're, if you didn't have good relationships with your students or the teachers didn't see something positive happening in your room. So with that platform, you really are in a place to start to find like-minded teachers, to find allies in your school so that you're not advocating alone and to organize with people in your school. And, and from there, that's when you can start taking on some school-wide issues. If you walk into the school and you don't have good relationships and your curriculum is, is a mess, and then you start telling other teachers what to do, that's a quick way to see yourself out of that school. So, you know, it's starting with yourself, your students, your curriculum, finding allies, and then you're in a place to create change in your school. So right now we're gonna go into the lightning round. And I just have a couple of questions to ask you about um i know you have a fetish for is it like cheetah or leopard print <laughs> it is it's leopard it's both i do both? love animal okay. print <laughs> so i, I want to know from you do you have a favorite leopard slash cheetah print accessory that you like to rock wow or, that's such a good wear? question <laughs> <laughs> um 
I do. I have this one purse that is leopard print that I do love. But also a friend got me a leopard print blouse for Christmas last year. And I wear that one a lot. Nice. And you mentioned that you're trying to do better with self-care. The big um, self-care activity I've been engaging in during the pandemic has been arts and crafts. I used to be an arts and crafts counselor. Um, and so I've been doing macrame and painting and some needlepoint and I, I'm finding it very calming. So if you can invite three people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? This is such a hard question. I mean, I can't, it, because the scope is so wide. So I actually try to think of it in terms of um, the scope of the book. And so um, I thought of, they're actually all alive. And so I suppose this is entirely possible, but I wanted to bring um, uh, Gloria Latson Billings. She is, you know, the North star to me in terms of education scholars. And um, Bettina Love, who I think is, you know, my current kind of North star with, um, the newly represented Congress person, Jamal Bowman, who I know from um, when he was a principal in the Bronx. And so I just think the three of them cooking stuff up around education and education policy would be um, a really exciting meal, <laughs> a very exciting meeting. And the very last thing is to let people know where they can connect with you. Uh, you could also share your website and just your social media handles so they can continue to follow the great work you're doing. Sure. Um, so my website is briepickhour.com. And um, there's a place where you can contact me through that. I'm on Facebook. I'm actually transitioning to like a professional Facebook page. Um, and uh, I'm on Instagram as bossy13, and that has four S's, bossy with four S's, 13. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Bree Picower, thank you so much for being here. Uh, once again, it's an honor to have you, and I just wish you much success with reading, writing, and racism. Please, people, if you don't have the book, make sure you go get the book. It is a must-read for every educator. Thank you so much for having me and I'm really looking forward to the summit. I can't wait. Yes, it's, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, thank you and wishing you a good rest of the day. All right, you too. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, folks, there you have it. Another powerful episode of my Dane Talk Educators Live. And I've been your host, Kwame Salfa Mensa. So until next time, people, I wish you a good morning, good night, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.